Welcome to the Christian Stories channel, where we dive deep into the timeless narratives of scripture, unraveling their profound meanings and uncovering valuable lessons for our lives today. Join us on this journey of exploration and discovery as we delve into the captivating story of Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Jesus Christ. In this episode, we'll explore the enigmatic character of Judas, whose name has become synonymous with betrayal. Through examining Judas's pivotal role in the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, we'll uncover deeper truths about the consequences of our choices, the nature of sin, and the complexities of divine providence. But before we begin, don't forget to hit that subscribe button below, along with the notification bell, so you never miss out on our latest uploads. Your support means the world to use and helps us continue bringing you enriching content like this. Also, be sure to leave a like and share your thoughts in the comment section. We love hearing from you. The story of Judas Iscariot is not merely a historical account, but a timeless parable that resonates with universal truths. It prompts us to examine our own hearts and confront the potential for betrayal within us. Betrayal not just of others, but of our values, principles, and faith. Moreover, Judas' tragic end serves as a cautionary tale, reminding us of the eternal consequences of our actions. It underscores the importance of moral integrity, accountability, and self-control, and the profound implications of every choice we make. Picture yourself confronted with an intriguing puzzle, where the words spoken by Jesus resound mysteriously. In this puzzle, we encounter four intricate parts, each challenging our comprehension. Let's break them down and delve into how they connect. The initial puzzle revolves around imagining the setting of Passover, specifically the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The scriptures direct us as to Mark 14, verse 21 where Jesus makes a profound statement that echoes like thunder. He declares that the Son of Man is destined for the cross, thus fulfilling prophecy. Additionally, he adds a sobering warning, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for man if he had not been born. The narrative progresses to the night when Christ, in a symbolic and friendly gesture, partakes in the Passover with his faithful companions on the eve of his impending death. The joys and solaces of this ancient ritual provided comfort, preparing them to confront the forthcoming sorrows, a lesson that emphasizes the importance of not allowing fear of the future to hinder participation in sacred rituals when the opportunity arises. Picture the scene, Jesus and the twelve disciples gathered around the table, an atmosphere filled with anticipation and camaraderie suddenly disrupted by solemn and prophetic words. With eyes conveying an incomprehensible burden, Jesus declares, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating me, with me. A shadow of sadness and anguish envelops the table, and one by one, the disciples vehemently deny any involvement in this act of betrayal. Nevertheless, Jesus persists indicating that among the twelve, one will act as a traitor. Confusion and unease permeate the air. Envision the bewilderment among the disciples who up until then had not suspected Judas. The notion that one of them plot to betray and potentially harm Jesus must have appeared ludicrous. Jesus does not directly single out Judas, despite his presence at the table with the other disciples. The traitor is not identified through an accusatory gesture, but rather through the shared portion of food they all partake in. Understanding the gravity of this act is crucial, especially within Middle Eastern culture, where betraying a friend after sharing a meal is deemed the ultimate betrayal. Here we step into the realm of betrayal with Judas Iscariot, an infamous figure in history playing his role. However, we must ask ourselves if Judas was fulfilling a prophecy. Can we truly label him as evil? Did his corrupt motives condemn him when facing judgment? Judas will not be able to justify himself before God by claiming he was merely fulfilling a predetermined destiny. This reflection brings us to Romans 9, verse 19, where the question of human responsibility in relation to divine will is raised. Why then does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? This passage serves as a reminder that while God permits humans to err and even brings glory from it, this does not excuse sin or diminish its gravity. Christ, delivered by the determined plan and foreknowledge of God, faced the tragic destiny foretold for him. However, it is crucial to emphasize that it was the hands of evil individuals that crucified him and led him to death. Acts 2 verse 23 we are reminded that although Christ's death was prophesied, it was through the hands of cruel and wicked men that he was nailed to the cross and sentenced to death. This passage deeply reflects on the unfolding divine scheme and human responsibility in executing this plan. Jesus' profound statement that it would have been better if Judas had never been born underscores the tragic fate awaiting the betrayer. This prompts us to reflect on the inevitable repercussions of our life choices. Jesus' anguish in response to the betrayal by one of his own offers profound insights into the nature of betrayal and its consequences. Judas' betrayal extends beyond the personal. It underscores each individual's moral responsibility for their actions. Judas chose to betray Jesus and had to bear the devastating consequences of that decision. 
His fate serves as a powerful reminder of the weight of choices in our lives, the impact we have on others, and the profound consequences that can alter the course of lives for the worse. The notion that Judas would have been better off not being born resonates like a painful echo of deep regret and the unbearable consequences that awaited him even before facing the depths of hell. In this next puzzle, we delve into Judas' final moments as recounted by Matthew taking us to Gethsemane, where he betrays Jesus for the last time. He likely accompanied Jesus to Caiaphas' palace where he witnessed the entire agonizing Jewish trial. Judas' life fell apart after the betrayal in Matthew 27 verses 1 to 4. We are taken to dawn as the chief priests and elders gather to discuss Jesus' condemnation. They bind him and deliver him to Pilate, the governor. It is at this point that Judas, the one who betrayed him, is overwhelmed with remorse. He returns the 30 pieces of silver to the religious leaders and elders, confessing, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Only Matthew's gospel recounts Judas's profound remorse and his desperate attempt to reject the blood-stained money. Conversely, Luke gives us a parallel account of Judas' fate in Acts 1 verses 16 to 19, explaining that Judas became a guide for those who arrested Jesus ultimately meeting a tragic end. Matthew's narrative conveys the depth of Judas's remorse, but it's noteworthy that the text carefully avoids suggesting Judas repented of his sin. The word used to describe his remorse differs from the word for repentance. Repentance involves a change of heart particularly about a specific sin, whereas remorse in this context signifies regret and sorrow for wrongdoing. While these concepts can overlap, Judas's remorse in this case suggests deep, guilt-prompting restitution, but not necessarily a genuine change of heart or repentance. This nuanced distinction prompts reflection on the complexity of repentance and human actions in relation to Judas's destiny. Did his remorse suffice to redeem his actions, or was he destined to face further devastating consequences? Judas acknowledges his sin in betraying Jesus, recognizing the enormity of his betrayal and its toll on his conscience. Judas tries to give back the 30 pieces of silver he received for betraying Jesus possibly as a desperate attempt to make amends for his mistake. By throwing the money into the temple, he aims to implicate the priests in his wrongdoing, suggesting that they share the guilt of his betrayal. Perhaps Judas hoped that Jesus would miraculously escape, escape from his captors. However, when Judas realizes that Jesus is condemned, he's overwhelmed with remorse. He returns the infamous reward to his accomplices, declaring that the spilled blood is that of an innocent man. This moment is profound and telling as even Judas in his final words before dying, asserts Jesus' innocence. Judas faces the consequences of his actions when confronted by the chief priests and elders. When questioned about Jesus' death, they respond apathetically, placing the blame on Judas tormented by guilt and the weight of his decisions. Judas throws the money into the temple and then takes his own life in despair. Hanging himself is a method of death that is morally condemned by both rabbinic Judaism and the early church, seen as a rebellion against God against God, the saligiver and taker of life, and prohibited by the sixth commandment. The accounts of Judas' death in Matthew 27, hanging, and Acts 1, falling headlong, are reconciled by a traditional explanation. According to this interpretation, the priests used the returned money to purchase a field, which became known as the Field of Blood. Due to its association with Judas' betrayal and death, this purchase fulfilled a prophecy from the book of Jeremiah about the 30 pieces of silver used to buy a potter's field. The rejection of Judas' money further underscores its cursed nature. In Matthew's account, the chief priests acknowledge that the money is tainted with blood and unsuitable for the temple treasury, opting instead to use it to acquire the potter's field. This event fulfilled the prophecy foretold by the prophet Jeremiah. The reference to Jeremiah can be interpreted as a general citation drawing from Zechariah 11 verses 11 to 13, where 30 pieces of silver are mentioned. This connection between Judas' actions and the words of the prophets underscores the intertwining of history and scripture. Judas' betrayal alongside the deceit and hardness of heart displayed by the chief priest. We're all anticipated by God these events highlight the profound consequences of betrayal and provoke contemplation on the leadership of Israel. Jesus' remarks about Judas serve as a haunting reminder that this truth applies to all unbelievers facing eternal judgment in hell, a chilling reality. Discussions often delve deeply into matters of free will and the eternal nature of souls. However, in practice, Christians are called to emulate Jesus, sharing the gospel, and grieving over those who reject it. Jesus possessed full knowledge of Judas's fate in hell, prompting us to explore further the third puzzle, Jesus' teachings on hell according to the gospel. Jesus' teachings on hell portray it not as a limited duration, but as an everlasting state. Those condemned to hell endure eternal torment where the fire never ceases. Jesus used vivid metaphors to illustrate the horrifying nature of hell, emphasizing the importance of avoiding sin and its consequences. 
He cautioned that it is preferable to lead a sacrificial life and renounce worldly temptations than to face eternal torment in hell. Jesus also encouraged his followers to pursue purity and holiness, steering clear of any allurements that might lead them astray. The mention of salt that has lost its saltiness underscores the necessity of upholding righteousness and peace within. The overarching message is unmistakable. Hell is a dreadful reality, and Jesus urges us to choose life and holiness over sin and everlasting suffering. Through this discourse, Jesus imparts a series of potent teachings as admonitions to his disciples, urging them to prioritize the battle against internal evil over external influences. Using exaggerated language, Jesus underscores the significance of removing anything that could lead to sin, even if it means figuratively removing a hand or a foot. It's crucial to understand that Jesus did not intend for his followers to interpret these instructions literally, much like one should not take Paul's Galatians' extreme measures to avoid sin as literal. The term used for hell in this context is an ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew term for the Hebrew term. This was an area outside Jerusalem's walls that had been tainted by abhorrent religious practices like Moloch worship and human sacrifices. Consequently, the Valley of Hinnom became a refuse dump where garbage was burned and maggots were abundant. This vivid and symbolic image portrayed the dreadful fate awaiting those condemned to die, to face eternal fire and unending worms. The lake of fire mentioned in Revelation 20 verses 13 to 15 is depicted as a place prepared for the devil and his followers. Symbolizing eternal separation from God, the idea is that those not listed in the book of life will confront this dreadful destiny, a striking image that deeply resonates with believers. Jesus' message is straightforward. Given the dreadful reality of hell, it's preferable to renounce anything in life than to encounter its torment. The depiction of hell as an abyss of everlasting suffering is starkly and frighteningly portrayed. Jesus wants his disciples to grasp the truth, that the kingdom of God should be viewed not only as a reward, but also as a call to sacrifice. He stresses that there is no escape from hell, no respite, and no solace to be found there. This reality is underscored in Luke 16 verse 26, which describes an impassable great gulf between those in hell and those in paradise. The account of Judas serves as a sobering reminder of the grave consequences of sin, of our moral choices and actions. It starkly illustrates that our decisions carry eternal significance. C.S. Lewis, a notable Christian author, acknowledged that while he would prefer to exclude the doctrine of hell from Christianity, it finds substantial support in scripture and the words of Jesus Lewis argued that the doctrine of hell, despite being a daunting reality, is fundamental to Christianity because it acknowledges that free will is in Jesus dedicated a substantial part of his teachings to discuss hell, offering profound insights into this topic. In fact, Jesus' teachings provide more information about hell than any other part of the Bible combined. He describes hell as outer darkness in Matthew 8:12 a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, teeth where those who reject God will be cast. Jesus mentions the imagery of fire and smoke associated with hell on numerous occasions, stressing its grim reality and dreadful nature as an undesirable destination. Jesus' narrative underscores a final encounter between himself and all humanity at the end of times. He will divide people into two groups, the sheep, who demonstrated faith in Jesus through their death, good deeds in the goats who did not demonstrate faith through their actions. The goats will face eternal punishment while the sheep will receive eternal life. This division is based on both faith and deeds. Despite Jesus' strong warnings about hell, he also offers a message of hope through his perfect life, sacrificial death on the cross and resurrection. Jesus conquered sin, death, and the devil. He encourages everyone to play. Jesus emphasizes that hell is a choice contrary to the kingdom of God, representing the absence of communion with God. While the kingdom of God offers eternal fellowship with him the precise location of hell and the fate of Judas have sparked various theories throughout history. In the Old Testament, the word translated as hell often refers to Sheol or Gehenna, associated with a place of waiting for judgment and eternal punishment for the wicked. Hell is depicted as a realm beyond our physical universe, where souls exist after death in unending agony for those who reject God. The book of Revelation elaborates on the final fate of Satan and unbelievers, describing a lake of fire and sulfur where they will be tormented forever. The judgment of unbelievers will occur before the great white throne, with those not found in the book of life cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 8 outlines the types of people facing this fate including the cowardly, unbelieving, immoral, murderers, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. In summary, Jesus' teachings on hell stress its reality and the importance of taking seriously the warnings about its consequences. Jesus spent more time warning about hell than comforting with the hope of heaven, urging everyone to consider their spiritual choices seriously and seek forgiveness and redemption in God to avoid the fate awaiting unbelievers. The interaction between Jesus and Judas during the betrayal underscores Jesus' message of love, forgiveness and compassion even towards those who betray. 
Jesus addresses Judas's friend, understanding the significance of the betrayal in relation to his mission and destiny on the cross. There is no indication of hatred towards Judas instead, Jesus demonstrates sadness and a deep understanding, standing of human weakness reflecting his consistent message of love and forgiveness throughout his teachings. As we conclude our exploration of Judah's story, we invite you to reflect on its profound significance. Let this narrative challenge and inspire you to live with authenticity and integrity, honoring the values of love, trust, and faithfulness exemplified by our Lord Jesus Christ.